Hi everyone, welcome to the Real Estate Tax Tips channel. My name is Cherry Chen, a Chartered Professional Accountant located in Oakville, Ontario, Canada. And I'm on a mission to become the Google Map for hardworking Canadians seeking financial freedom. Today, I have a very special guest here, Dimitri Borstein. I have him because a lot of people, a lot of our clients come to us and say that, hey, like Canadian real estate is so unaffordable. Where is the outlet? I want to start investing in the US, but I don't know how. And this is the exact reason I have Dimitri here with us today. So Dimitri, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, definitely. Well, again, thank you for having me. Um, so my background is I used to be working at a, a large private equity real estate investment shop, mm. um, mostly focused on acquisitions in uh, in the U.S. Uh, predominantly Sun Belt market. Um, probably have over seven billion dollars of uh, direct uh, real estate experience in terms of transactions under my belt, and at a time we were close to twenty thousand units under management in the U.S. And most recently, I'm one of the co-founders at Share. We are an asset management platform for retail investors that are looking to be landlords in the US. So we streamline everything kind of end to end from helping you find the opportunity to being your partner in operations and you know, maximizing your returns. So that sounds really interesting. So tell us a little bit about your former job. I know I'm just a little bit nosy. Yeah. So, so 20,000 units in, um, in the Sunbelt states. What is Sunbelt States? Yeah, so the Sunbelt States would be kind of the southern uh, part of the U.S., really kind of stemming from, you know, Texas through to Florida, you know, and then um, going a little bit, you know, to the southeast, Georgia, oh. Tennessee, um, those kind of areas, you know, they're typically seeing in migration. It's a warmer climate. Oh, it's a cheaper okay. cost of living. So it's been a big focus for institutional uh, real estate investors that are, you know, actively buying up uh, residential properties, both, you know, um, single family homes and, uh, you know, multifamily apartment complexes. Oh, so your former employer being that big, mm -hmm. they are also interested in single family homes. They, they, they had launched um, a single family um, line of business as well uh, uh, more recently, but predominantly we're more focused on apartments. Mm. But there are a lot of large institutions that have you know, tens of thousands of uh, units of single family homes uh, in those areas. Wow, wow, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, this is like, because a lot of my clients, they buy properties in Canada. They, mm -hmm. buy, they start off with single family home or condo, and then make it duplex or make it triplex, or now um, make it fourplex and up because there is a new tax incentive. But um, they usually start with like single family home, duplex, triplex, and then they decided to go bigger, go mm -hmm. big or go but home and buy like <laughs> 10 plex, six plex, and then all the way 20, 30, 40 plex. Mm. So, um, and they claim that it's easier to manage and all these reasons for mm. it. But then I'm surprised to see that institutional investors are coming from like multifamily to um, single family yeah. home. Yeah, no, you raise yours a, a very good point. So I think, you know, historically, mm. it's probably been the case. Um, you know, it's uh, more efficient to operate a, you know, one property with, mm. you know, 300 units than, you know, 300 separate homes. Um, but with a lot of innovation in tech when it comes to leasing, um, with, you know, the single family kind of subclass of real estate in the US becoming its own category. Yeah. Um, it's really, you know, um, streamlined um, those operations. And you can now, because of innovation, because of tech, you can operate you know, single family assets, mm -hmm. even scattered across um, the whole city, um, probably even more efficiently than you would a, a single multifamily property because you have you know, less common area space mm -hmm. that you have to um, keep upkeep, um, you know, leasing staff that have to sit there all, all day at the property. So it's definitely seen a lot of investments, uh, a lot of investment from institutional. And yeah, you know, uh, you know, what we want to do is bring that uh, to a retail investor and help them build their own portfolio. So now instead of, you know, starting off with mm -hmm. a single family home, and then eventually going to a duplex and then you know a 10 unit multifamily as you scale up you can now just have 10 single family homes yeah. across 10 different markets exposed to different trends 
you know, different employment drivers and, you know, not only reap the efficiency of operations, but also diversification and, you know, you know, de-risking some of that uh, for, for our retail clients. This is crazy because you have been using some big terms, which I really like those <laughs> terms. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with those terms as well. Um, diversification, de-risking. Um, but what I heard is that you can buy now, buy multiple properties in multiple cities, and, and that's still possible. Yes. And tell me how it's possible because I've owned properties, uh, personally still own properties in Hamilton and St. Catharines, and you have two different teams working for you in two different areas, and they always come back with questions, and we have questions from tenants, we have questions from, actually we have properties also in Toronto, even though it's one. Like, so then you can see like Hamilton, St. Catharines, Toronto, they're like, yes, they're not that far away from each other, which is the part that's painful. They're still far enough that I need to have a different team for a different house. Mm. Um, so my question to you is, how do you make it easy? I don't get it. Yeah, so um, in essence, we would, we would have third party property managers mm. that oversee you know, the day to day operations yep. on behalf of our you know, investors that own the home. So in different markets and maybe a different manager, and these are you know, larger type of companies that specialize in managing single family homes, mm. and they have scale. You know, they're probably managing thousands, if not tens of thousands of units for many big institutions. And they don't typically work with one-off investors, but because of share, them seeing share as like their one client, we are basically that institution that they're servicing while we you know, work individually with the investors that own the home. And while you may have a, you know, different teams, we centralize everything. We streamline all the accounting and reporting and all the questions that the tenants are asking or any decision you need to make when it comes to, um, is it a good time to renovate? Mm -hmm. What should the rent increase be? You know, what are my options for growth and liquidity? You know, um, refinancing and or disposition. We are the ones that are fielding those questions as we're acting as your asset manager or the owner on your behalf. And then, you know, we will just communicate with our clients and kind of make sure they're on board with the decision because ultimately they do have the control. But we do all that work and make it easy for you, whether if those properties are, you know, an hour drive from where you live um, or, you know, multiple hours away on an airplane. Okay, I've never heard of a product like this. So. Are you, am I right to say that you're the first? Yeah, we're, we're really the, the first. Only, yeah, probably yeah, also. Yeah. The only. Exactly. We're yeah. definitely kind of trying to, we saw a gap that, you know, retail investors, unlike, you know, what's really been only available for like high net worth individual investing mm. with these institutional asset managers, or you would have, you know, the big pension funds or the life, mm -hmm. life companies investing into real estate through these big asset managers. There was nothing available for a retail investor that it would allow them to build their own portfolio mm. um, of directly owned real estate. And that's, uh, yeah, we're at the forefront of it and we're the only ones. Wow. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So, okay, tell me, tell me why Share Focus on single family home. As far as I know, Share Focus managing and helping retail yeah. investors buying single family home. Why single family home? Yeah, so I think single family homes in the US specifically is has been a very resilient asset class. Even, you know, we've seen that recently, even with the increase in interest rates, you know, the values have, you know, held up, you know, rents are increasing, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's very good trends macro-wise in terms of, you know, how the economy is doing, you know, despite some of the, the forecasts that didn't come into fruition in 2023. Yeah. Um, and I think the big thing about the single family space is, it's an accessible entry point for mm -hmm. people looking to invest into real estate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our our homes are typically, you know, sub $350,000 US. Um, a lot of the times um, you're, you, you're able to cash flow it even with, um, you know, uh, not too big of a down payment anywhere from 20 to, to 30%. Mm -hmm. um, you can still find cash flowing opportunities. And, you know, for us, the resiliency, the safety of the asset class and the accessibility of it make it a perfect kind of entry point for people. And with this innovation that we talked about and with the companies involved in, you know, in property management mm -hmm. and servicing the industry, you're able to build your own portfolio so you can scale up 
and now you can you know build to having 10 20 properties across multiple markets multiple sub markets you know new old um, and mm -hmm. really yeah really kind of uh, reap the benefits of uh, direct ownership that's awesome well, I think we are not geeking enough, so <laughs> geeking out enough, we need to do that. I wanted to uh, share with you guys this, this report <laughs> that we were talking about. You can't see anything uh, here, yeah. but there is a report that, um, I, I guess Dimitri doesn't fall asleep reading these reports, <laughs> no. but I definitely would. I think one of the reports actually says that single-family home has the least amount of decline, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it just yeah, exactly. In terms of how how it's held up, you know, relative to the asset class, I have a lot of things here, so I think it's on the second page over yeah. here. But but yeah, um, yeah, cool. It's one of the report that he get exclusive access to, and it basically says single family home rental. If I'm reading it yeah. correctly, single family rental, not home like single family rental yeah. has a decline from the peak 2022 peak only five percent yeah and there is like office is obviously crazy yeah I, is crazy. 56 percent apartment is declined has a decline 33 percent even senior housing yeah has a decline had a decline and then self-storage as well i'm surprised the self-storage would yeah i mean again i think it's you know driven by the interest economy, rate economy, yeah, yeah driven by the fact that you know right now i mean more so in the institutional kind of um, asset classes there's just less activity you know mm. sellers don't really want to sell buyers yeah. don't want to buy but in single family homes it's not just investors looking to buy the product there's also homeowners mm -hmm. you know a lot of the time you know they're looking at the you know at buying the home for different reasons yep. right and um, there's still some activity going on but a lot of home sellers aren't selling so that's also limited the amount of transactions taking place which mm -hmm. is again allowed the the values to you know stay you know stay relatively flat and outperform other asset classes within uh, within real estate mm, awesome that's 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 perfect. I'm keeping these reports <laughs> just for my <laughs> nighttime reading pleasure, if I can't fall asleep. Um, so now you've, uh, I guess the reason why you know to look for these reports was had a lot to do with um, your experience in your previous from your previous job as well. You mm -hmm. had experience looking at like, are there any lessons that you learned from like buying these, not helping or being a part of this twenty thousand unit? Um, yeah, management help you with your like applying your knowledge to share and helping retail investors to buy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think you know, first and foremost, being diligent with your assumptions mm -hmm. and really getting kind of granular on things you are estimating and mm -hmm. things you're including in your forecast. Yeah. You know, a lot of the times we see you know numbers being presented that just don't include everything that you're going to incur, whether it's mm -hmm. costs on the acquisitions or costs during your ownership. Um, so I think, you know, being part of a large uh, portfolio that, was, that I kind of got to see the operations on allowed me to kind of see all these things. Mm -hmm. So now I can, you know, include them as we're estimating numbers uh, for our clients. You know, the other thing I think it's, it's shown me is, you know, the value of, you know, looking at data points across, you know, many different, um, you know, uh, sources, Cities, many different factors, yeah, the and then also, you know, utilizing what's what's best, right? It's, it's, it's uh, you know, access to your proprietary knowledge and mm -hmm. your proprietary information. So a lot of the times the best knowledge you would have on a sub-market is if you already own in that sub-market. Yeah. So, you know, working with the type of managers that we work with, um, with the deals we have under, we have that visibility that allows us to have those insights to help other clients as they look to expand their portfolio to those regions. For us as Canadians, because I'm also exploring purchasing through share um, uh, properties in the states, which like the states are so big. Where like, I mean, you mentioned Sun Belt states. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you select a city? Yeah. So I mean. Other than following your um, former employer's footsteps, uh, I mean a lot. A lot of the, you know you are looking at where are institutions buying. I mean, you know, there's some good data showing kind of appreciation, outpacing in those uh, in those markets just because of the excess capital like being. Like these reports. <laughs> um, but you know, in terms of 
being our focus, yeah, we are focused kind of on the Sun Belt, um, you know, Texas, Georgia. Um, you know, we, we are looking at some of the some properties in Midwest. A lot of it will come down to kind of a personal preference and our individual clients, mm -hmm. you know, buying power depending on the capital they have, you know, what they're looking at, what type of home, you know, we can kind of gear where, you know, which specific metro we'd look at. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're looking at a lot of data points for long-term investors, you know, job growth, you know, household growth, what are, you know, rents to income, um, you know, how has oh, how has that market that per, how has the market performed? So a lot of that allows us to kind of narrow down our focus because we want to target places where there is demand for rent from rentals, where you know renting is a discount to home ownership, which right now is even amplified by the interest rates, mm -hmm. and you know look for places where there's demand for housing, where you know there is an imbalance between supply and demand because that's going to help maximize your returns over the long term mm -hmm. as you know people continue to rent and are, are priced out from from buying homes yeah I can see some of these data here I'm not going to read it all because you don't want to read it all you don't want me to read it all it's gonna be so boring but there's rent to income uh, supply growth employment growth median household income by um, by cities yeah like I'm, I've just never seen these reports, these types of reports. It's so interesting, even for me to, like I mean, I look at numbers all the time as well. Not in, not from the data analytics yeah. specific. Yeah, and a lot of oh, there's a, you know there are there are a lot of good data available, whether it's in, through the census, mm -hmm. you know, um, a lot of some of it is free, some of it is behind paywalls, but it is a byproduct of kind of feeding a lot of it in to mm -hmm. get a full picture, and you know to to really draw in and really understand. You know, these factors are great, but where are my risks, mm -hmm. right? You might have unbelievable job growth and unbelievable wage growth, but it might also be the highest supply market, right? Yeah. So then we have to understand that, and that kind of helps you formulate your assumptions, and you know, you validate it through some third-party third party research. So, okay, so let me ask you this question. I'm sure all your clients ask you the same question. Like, I have, like, say, I have $200,000 to invest, Canadian. So maybe make it 150 US dollars, 150,000 US dollars. Where should I invest? I mean, I think if you're, you know, looking to kind of get into a singular deal, again, our goal is to help you build a portfolio, mm -hmm. right? Which will have exposure to multiple markets. And I think you always want to have have that goal set, yep. that that's what you work towards. But if you're, you know, the important part is to start. And I think with that, with that magnitude investment, I think you're trying to you know, get into a B-class home mm -hmm. um, in something like an Atlanta, right? It's a very stable, desirable institutional market. It's got a lot of solid, great employment drivers, um, very large airport, a lot of Fortune 500s, mm -hmm. and a lot of neighborhoods where you can still find affordable um, cash flowing product while looking at kind of that, you know, 30, 35% down payment mm. um, with the 200,000 Canadian. Mm. So I think there's definitely opportunities. Now, there's always a trade-off. You know, you might be looking more for cash flow. So we might go to smaller markets that have better yields, mm -hmm. but we'll see lower appreciation over the long term. Or you might not be focused on cash flow today, but want, you know, the best, you know, market for, with drivers for long-term appreciation. And that will kind of help us steer in other directions. So there is a personal element to it, but you know, a general answer would be I, I do like Atlanta. So <laughs> okay. that's where I'm looking. <laughs> awesome. My next question, which we're not going to answer today, but I'm going to ask anyway, is that if I want to build a portfolio that gives me ten thousand dollars monthly cash flow, where should it be? Like how much money do I need to to do that? And we'll save that for our next video, so we're not going to answer that question. Actually, uh, like we may not even share that with our next video when we share that at our um, upcoming event. So we're going to um, share, 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 share. We are going to uh, have a webinar, host a webinar, co-host a webinar together with Share. Uh, February 29th at night time and uh, we want to invite everyone who's interested in buying or investing in the US to come to our share webinar and 
and then all learn a little bit about what Share does, and then I will also talk a little bit about the tax structure and how to own the U.S. properties in the proper format so you don't get double taxation. Um, yeah, so exactly. I'm looking, looking forward, forward to it. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. I know Dimitri is a numbers guy, so don't worry, guys. If Dimitri is too difficult to understand, I am there. I am a simple girl, so yeah. I will explain it in simple terms for you. So for anyone who is interested in the webinar, the webinar registration link would be in the show notes below, and it will also be in our, um, I guess, on screen. So make sure that you register for our webinar on February 29th. Wow, thank you so much, Yeah, Dimitri. thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, this is fun. So yeah. I, well, I'm looking forward to my $10,000 portfolio, but I first have to find out how much money down payment I need. Exactly. And then I need to also save up for that down payment. Yeah, it's, it's not all at once, but yeah, but yeah we'll definitely doable. walk you through it and um, we'll set that plan in motion. Yeah, so multi-step, so yeah, exactly. exciting. All right, thank awesome. you guys. Thank you.